education crisis? Raise your hands if you have. The headlines are often pretty grim, but the thing that you have to remember, even though you hear about failing teachers and failing schools and not enough graduates, is that we have twin processes going on. Just as you have, for example, a diamond form when you put intense pressure on a lump of coal, so is our education system experiencing rapid change because of the challenges being placed on it. You have, for example, these twin processes, what I call crisis and victory. In my job as education editor at Good Magazine, what I really enjoy doing is telling the stories of the victories, those innovations out there that are proving to be complete game changers. So here are some of the victories that I think you should know about. Last fall, Stanford professors Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig famously offered their highly popular Introduction to Artificial Intelligence class online to the world for free. Volunteers translated the classes into over 40 languages. 23,000 students from all around the world actually ended up completing it from over 190 countries. These students were ones that are historically underrepresented in the field and possibly wouldn't have otherwise had an opportunity to take a class at Stanford. Students from low-income background, students of color, people who were women, single moms. But this testimonial from this earnest young man in India really stood out to me. Hi, I am Anand Mukhlikar from Pune, India. This free AI class literally liberated me, gave a new direction to my life. I am highly motivated because of this class. I am going to take great strides in my previous interests of image processing, computer vision, and robotics using AI class so that I can solve maybe some of the problems affecting mankind in the third world countries and India in particular. I'm literally overwhelmed at the possibilities after this class and I hope and I'm, I'm sure that it's going to be people like me who are going to make the future a whole lot better. Thank you, AI class team. Bye. that teaching this one class had more impact than his entire educational career. He since went on and founded Udacity, a complete online platform that enables anyone in the world to access university level education, again, for free. His first class is on building a search engine and he hopes to have a half million students sign up to take it. Can you imagine that? Half a million students learning how to build a search engine every six months? I say Google better watch out. Of course, MIT is the granddaddy of the open education movement. A decade ago, their open courseware project revolutionized access to education. And now they're taking that same spirit to the next level with MITx. Through this free online platform, students again, anywhere in the world, will be able to access an online, completely free university sort of education. Now here's the thing. If you want to get a certificate, if you can prove mastery of the content, for a small, still to be determined fee, let's hope that that fee is not too high, you'll be able to do so. No, it's not an MIT degree, but I imagine employers are still going to be pretty excited about that. Of course, business school is also pretty pricey, but MIT Sloan School of Business is also now offering an online simulator that allows anyone in the world to access the nuts and bolts of a business education. Again, totally free. This is just the first past six months. Now imagine what the next decade is going to look like in open education. Social media really fueled the Occupy Wall Street and Arab Spring movements, but it's also proving to be a game changer within the education space as well. How many of you all have ever had a tough time getting a meeting with a professor before? Raise your hands. Absolutely. Sometimes it can feel so difficult, it's like trying to get a meeting with the president. Well, Google Plus is not even a year old, and both the president and professors are experimenting with it. You have professors who are, for example, using it to host virtual office hours with their students in the Hangouts, or they're using it to connect students to each other so that they can work on class projects together. Sometimes I still have people who say to me, Liz, I don't want to get Twitter. Well, I'll tell you this, the savvy educators are the ones out there who are incorporating it into the classroom to really ensure that their kids are engaged and are accessing the material. Imagine this, you're in a classroom and the professor asks a question and instead of answering it, if you're really shy, all you have to do is tweet with a given hashtag, and all of a sudden, it's all streamed up on the wall for you. And then you can see what everyone around you is thinking. That's a real game changer. Of course, sometimes educators are tempted to think that if you just let kids loose with their smartphones, 
They're just going to go wild and be back there checking their Facebook page and things like that. But here's the deal. If we actually train students how to use social media properly within an education context, before you know it, that same black nail polish wearing student who swore up and down that she hated to write is going to be the one managing a class project blog or Facebook page. Of course, you have, when it comes to teachers, you have teachers also being connected through social media as well. When I was in the classroom, I only had the opportunity to maybe go across the hall and ask my colleagues for ideas or maybe go to those sort of once in a while big education conferences. And now, through grassroots centric, education centric hashtags like EdChat, EdTech, Higher EdChat, educators across the globe are connecting to each other in meaningful ways. Now, instead of wondering how exactly it was that educators in Finland are getting the results that they do, all you have to do is go on Twitter and ask them directly, and you'll have access to that global conversation. I may be dating myself here, but I'll tell you this. When I was a kid, this was gaming. And there was absolutely no education relevancy. Everybody said, if you play those games, you're going to end up you know, a lost generation. Well, that lost generation part may be still be up for debate. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. By the time she's 21, the average young person has spent 10,000 hours playing video games. So wouldn't it be a good idea if we actually harness all that addiction to video gaming for educational purposes? That's exactly what some of the most innovative projects out there are really doing. You have professors who, for example, are using popular games like World of Warcraft to teach classics like Beowulf or Lord of the Rings. I never even played World of Warcraft before, but I'll tell you this, it looks so cool, it makes me want to go and write a paper comparing Frodo and Sam to the heroes in the game. How many of you guys are Angry Birds addicts? <laughs> Guilty as charged. Well, think about this. There is an Atlanta physics teacher who used the game to teach his kids the concept of velocity. They were absolutely hooked. He said they understood the concepts in only 30 minutes. But it wasn't just the amount of time that was so amazing to him. He said they understood it at a depth that he had never seen before. And that's a real victory. Of course, it might be kind of tough to get college professors on board without any play Angry Birds in class. It's been real, okay? But that doesn't mean that we can't find new ways to foster collaboration and engagement and ensure a deeper, deeper level of conversation and solving real-world problems in the classroom. The flipped classroom model. How many of you have heard of the Khan Academy and that model that they use? Fantastic. So for those of you who haven't, the way that it works is you take all of the information you used to get in a lecture in the classroom, and then you study that on your own. And then when you go back to class, you actually have the opportunity to engage in real world situations and solve those problems together and discuss things and maybe go out on experiential learning products, projects. To make this sort of discussion and, and consultation within a classroom environment a little bit easier, a Harvard physics professor named Eric Nazer has designed a software called Learning Catalytics. The way that it works is all you have to do, if you're a professor, you just upload all the open-ended questions and things that you want to check to see if your students actually understand. Then, during the class, you ask them those questions. They use, again, their own smartphone or laptop or tablet device and respond, and all of that information comes back to the professor. Even in a lecture hall full of 20, 200 students, you can instantly get a snapshot and understand where your students really need to dive deeper or what they're understanding, and that's a real victory. Now, I may, again, be dating myself, but when I was in high school, the big debate was whether you should be studying French or Spanish. But most experts nowadays say that the second language that every student, regardless of their age, needs to learn is computer coding. You have, for example, in the UK, a parent-organized initiative called Coding for Kids that is pressuring the government there to get on board with introducing coding even at a very early, early grades. Similarly, in the UK, there's a charity called Raspberry Pi, which has actually created a $25 credit card sized computer built specifically for teaching students coding and hacking. In South Los Angeles, you have the Fauche Tech Academy, which is an amazing school that serves an entirely low income population of students of color, which is teaching them coding, uh, web design, Photoshop, all essential skills. And you also have in New York City, all the way across the country, another innovative school called P Tech. This is a collaboration between the Department of Education, the City Colleges of New York, and IBM. Here's the way it works. All students do through their technical curriculum is study 
And then at the end of the six years, because this is the thing, six years, okay, you get a high school diploma, an associate's degree. You can go on to a four-year university if you want to, but if you don't, you can go get a job at IBM. That's a real victory. <laughs> Of course, maybe you're not in high school anymore. Maybe you just want to learn coding because you enjoy it. You need to go to the Code Academy then. It's, again, another free online platform that enables anyone anywhere in the world to learn the nuts and bolts of coding. I don't know about you, but given the need for the tech workforce of the future and how we need to get more science, technology, engineering, and math uh, students invested in these things, it seems like 300,000 people signing up for the Code Academy in just a few weeks is a real victory. I am a big fan of the silent movie Metropolis, but I have to tell you, I'm pretty glad that when I go to work at Good, it doesn't look like this. <laughs> what we're finding right now is that we know that we don't need workers who are just sort of mute robots. We need people who are vibrant, alive, have that creative spark. And actually, a recent IBM poll of over 1,500 CEOs indicated, and here's what they said really, they said that creativity is the number one edge in the 21st century economy. <coughs> To that end, last year we saw the first ever National Imagination Summit that brought together experts to really discuss creative thinking and how we can bring that back into all level levels of education. We even have the No Right Brain Left Behind Challenge, which harnesses design firms. <laughs> they harness design firms and all sorts of amazing things to, again, figure out how we can put that creative spark back into our education system. So why are all these things so important? Well, this is the most recent picture of Earth photographed by NASA. It's the most high-res photo of Earth ever taken before. They call it the Blue Marble. And you'll notice that anywhere you hail from in the Blue Marble, we're all in this together. So why is it that when we're discussing those education challenges, all the crises that you hear about, that it's all about how you figure out how to out-innovate or out-educate each other? Shouldn't it be about us working together to figure out how we can reach a new level of global prosperity? Indeed, that's why it's so important to really think through all these victories that we're experiencing right now in our education system. The technology, the collaboration, the creativity. This is all laying the foundation for a new level of global prosperity that is unprecedented in human history. Again, we're all a part of this. These are the victories that I look forward to telling you more about. Thank you.